Okay, in this class, we're going to solely talk about LRFD, load resistance factor design. We're not going to talk about ASD. I will talk about what the difference is between the two, and you'll find out that really there isn't any differences. There's just the way you apply the safety factor. Okay, it's just the way you apply the safety factor. They're all, they're all the same. Um, <coughs> now, when we say LRFD, um, it stands for load resistance factor design. Um, it was invented in Europe in after World War II, after it, it had been destroyed by the Germans. And, you know, I guess other people destroyed the German stuff too. But they all came together and said, you know, if we're going to build stuff, we need to slim it down if we can. We need, to, we need to trim the safety factors. We need to tune the safety factors for what we're wanting to do. Okay? Kind of open, open the, uh, the door for LRFD. And it's been, it's been introduced pretty much worldwide after that. Now, LRFD is an ultimate strength design method. That means it talks about when are things going to break. That's what it's all about. When are things going to break? Now, within LRFD or within the current code provisions, we have service checks as well. Okay, we have things. Breakage is bad, scary, but we also have things where um, if it moves too much, that's not good. Right? If we're in this room and we see all of a sudden the room sag two inches when somebody walks above it. That would scare you. It would scare me. Okay, I don't know if maybe you're maybe you're braver than I am. Okay, but it would scare me if the ceiling kept moving over and over again when people walked over the top of it. Right? We don't want that. We want our people to to like our structures, to enjoy their structures, and to use them for a really long period of time. But the majority of the checks are ultimate strength. Looking at at, at breaks, there are some things about deflection checks and yielding checks and things like that that we also use. But the majority of the checks are ultimate. When are things going to break? You with me? Great. Now, if we look at how every single check you're ever going to do in this class and ever going to do with LRFD, it's broken down like this. We're going to have something that we call the nominal strength. Okay, this is what if we, if someone put a gun to our head and said, how strong is this going to be? This is the best bet. Okay, this is the best bet we could calculate. If you're trying to predict when something will break, you don't use safety factors. Why would you use safety factors if you're trying to predict, right? It doesn't make any sense to use safety factors if you're trying to predict. Now, if you're trying to provide a safe structure, yes, those are good things, safety factors, okay? But we have this thing called the nominal strength, and these are the, the formulas we get out of the AISC code, all right? And then on top of that, we multiply every one of those by a fee factor. Now, I'm going to ask a question. Is fee factor... You've used those before, right? Yeah? Are those numbers greater than one or less than one? I can't hear you. Oh, you have to hit the red button. You have to, if you're going to talk, you got to hit the button. Braden, talk. Less than one. Less than one. That's right. They're always less than one. Why? Because they're on this side of the equation. They lower the capacity, right? Yeah. Then we have factored load effects. They're not just the loads we have to deal with. We actually put safety factors on our loads, right? Load factors. And if this is the first time you're hearing this or seeing this, this might not be the class for you. All right? Great. So we have axial forces, moments, etc. That's what our magnified loads are. Now, I'm going to make a, a minor a, a correction. Um, to my notes, the load factors. Now, nah, that's not exactly right. Load factors are not from ASCE 7. Load factors are from AISC. But, but what is from ASCE 7? What do we get from ASCE 7? What is ASCE 7? Hmm. Hmm. Nobody knows. Okay, homework assignment. Everyone in this class is going to go find a copy of ASCE 7, and you're going to photocopy, you're going to take a picture of you with the code. Okay? Yeah. None of this photocopy the, the cover and go hand it out to all your friends, okay? You're going to take a picture of you with the code, okay? And I'm going to, and it's going to be due on Friday. And you're going to come back to me with what ASCE 7. You're going to look inside of it. It's not just about taking your picture with it. You're going to look inside of it. 
Where do you think you could find a copy of it? Oh, that's right. We have a former library expert right back there. So we can talk to her about, we can bribe her after class about where to find ASCE 7. But I'd bet architecture library. That's where I'd bet. Okay? Great. So we can answer this question. I'll ask that to you again and you can turn those in on Friday. All right? What ASCE 7 is all about. Okay. So we have various failure modes. Um, th these are these limit states that we have to check. So we have to check yielding, fracture, lateral torsion, and buckling, etc. You have to check everything that could happen. Anything and everything that can happen. What you're going to learn as a structural engineer, though, that you will get a feel for problems. You will understand that when a beam is extremely short, flexural is less likely to control and shear is more likely. And when beams are extremely long, shear never controls. If you do a shear calc and it controls, you have done something wrong. Unless there's just something else really strange happening. All right, which is always possible, right? It's always possible. But those kind of internal thoughts are what you need to be developing as you become structural engineers, okay? What's, what do I expect to control? What numbers do I expect to get? And if you're not thinking that way, you are being a robot, okay? And I don't want to train robots, okay? Because I only have to do that once, and they can go out into the world and do something over and over again. Training people, engineers make decisions, okay, have judgments, all right, great. The nominal strength formulas in the spec are reduced by fee factors, hey, we talked about that, to approximate a lower bound to the test data and to consider the type of failure, whether it's a brittle failure or a ductile failure. What you'll find is that not all fee factors are the same numbers, right? Flexural fee factor, who remembers? What's, what's the fee factor for a flexural failure? Anybody remember? Uh, let's go back simpler. How about an axial failure? Well, it depends. It depends. If it's yielding, what was the fee factor? Who remembers? 0.9. If it's fracture, what's the fee factor? Higher or lower? Lower. What's the number? 0 0.75. 0 0.75. These are numbers that should just roll off your tongue. All right? Be tattooed on your eyelids, all right? Something you just know, all right? 0.9 and 0.75 are the fee factor for yield and fracture. Why are they different? Because of the type of failure? Because of the type of failure. Now, both failures are bad, but yielding, what's that mean? It means it gives a little, right? It gives a little, and sometimes that can be really bad in certain, um, certain circumstances, okay? Extremely bad. For example, for the, the pipe that's holding up our projector, if it gets to yielding, if the pipe gets to yielding, that is bad because it will just stretch and stretch and stretch. And you know what? I might not be able to see what's going on anymore, right? It might not fall. We might not be able to project the way we thought we would, right? If it yielded. If it fractures... What's that mean? It's coming down, right? David and Jennifer are diving out of the way, right? Right? Dan's going to try to catch it, probably. Anyway, that's what, that's what would happen, right? That's what would happen. So we have different safety factors depending whether it's a brittle failure or a ductile failure, okay? If, you have, if it's a brittle failure, we want a higher safety factor, lower fee factor, remember? Because fee factors are on the left-hand side of the equation. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. If it's a ductile failure, it means we're going to have some warning. It's going to have some ductility. We're going to actually be able to use this thing called structural resiliency, which we'll talk about today in class. Okay? So we're able to give a little bit. We're able to live a little bit more. Okay? So you can get away with a little bit less of a safety factor. You with me? Awesome. Now, when we talk about factor of safety or safety factor, when we talk about for LRFD, it's really something like the average load factor. Because not all the load factors are the same, right? If you don't remember them, they're in your manual, but they're also here just for fun on the, on the, on the next page. You know, 1.4 dead, 1.2 dead, plus 1.6 live, plus 0.5, whether it's roof, live load, snow load, or some ponding load, okay? 
you've heard about these, you've seen these, okay? If this is the first time you've seen these, this might not be the class for you, all right? Great. So you take these average load factors. Remember, it's 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. The average of those two. What's the average? Well, it's going to depend on the ratio of dead to live, isn't it? If there's more dead, then the average is going to be closer to 1.2. If there's more live, the average is going to be closer to 1.6. Does that make sense? Yeah? Excellent. So we take this average load factor and we divide it by the fee factor. And that gives us our safety factor, all right? And we'll talk more about that coming up. We've got this typical safety factor is about 1.67 for yield, about 2.0 for fracture, all right? And that's across the board. That's, that's, that is the established safety factor for structural steel design. When we're talking, whether we're talking about allowable stress design, okay, or allowable strength design, or whether we're talking about LRFD, these are the numbers. Now, there are some nuances. There are some extra safety factors that are buried in the code in certain, certain places. But by and large, when someone asks you, what's the safety factor on your structure? It's 2.0 against fracture. It's 1.76 against yield. Okay? Yeah? Okay. So I have an example down here. We don't need to look at this. But again, if it helps jog your memory, great. I've got something like a bar I'm designing. I've got some dead and live load. I factor it. I've got an Fy. I have an equation, Fy times Ag, okay? And I'm, I'm gonna basically then change, and my fee factor is 0.9. This is what my equation ends up coming up to look like. I'm gonna solve for what Ag is, and I find I need 7.72 inches squared, okay? Don't worry, when we cover topics that are new, I won't go over an example that fast, okay? But that should be something you have seen before. Now the fee factors were developed by calibrating to old allowable strength design safety factors for live to dead load versus three. Now, you will hear people talk about LRFD, you will hear people talk about a, it's a statistically based design and you have these distribution factors and you're going to force yourself in distribution factors. I'm not saying those things are wrong, but I am telling you from the people that I had classes from that wrote the code, they said this is what they did. They wanted the safety factors for the live load to dead load ratio of three to be the same. They let them vary from that. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, basically, I took, if you take the equations from ASD, the dead load plus live load divided by 0.6 times Fy. This is an equation, if we were talking about ASD in this class, this is an equation that we would use to look at, at yielding. Okay, looks something like that. And in L or FD, we are much more comfortable about looking at an equation that looks something like this. Okay, it's the same problem we worked on the previous page. Okay, just doing in, in, in symbols. You're with me? Kind of, sort of. Okay, great. Now, if I'm going to force my live load be equal to three times my dead load. I'm going to force that to happen. I'm going to make it be that way. Okay. Then when I plug in this equation, my dead load is going to be equal to my dead load plus three times my dead load. Well, why is it three dead load? Because I load is equal to three times the dead, right? Yeah. Okay. I get four d over 0.6 fy. If I do the same thing over here, and I'm going to leave my fee as a fee. I'm going to leave it just fee. I'm going to solve for it. Yeah. Yeah. Plug in here, 1.2 dead plus 1.6. Why is it 3D? Because three times the dead load is equal to the live load. Yeah? Great. So I get 6D over phi FY for the same design. So if I'm forcing my safety factors to be the same, then I have to solve for what phi needs to be. You with me? You do the math. Cancel, 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 cancel. You get a phi has to be 0.9. Okay? That's what they've done. They have calibrated the LRFD code so when the live load is equal to three times the dead load, that safety factors are the same. Okay? I got a great question for you. What happens if they're not the same? What do you do? Well, 
hey, I did that for you. Right down here at the bottom. I've done the numbers. And I'm, what I'm solving for here is, um, I said, how do, you, how do the results compare as the ratio of live and dead load changes for gross yielding? What, what, I'm, what I'm saying here is that they have tailored the safety factors to be exactly the same. The same. When live load is equal to three times dead load. Notice my ratio. My area that I need for an LRFD design versus my area I need for an ASD design are exactly the same if live load is equal to three times dead. You with me? Okay. So what happens if live is just equal to dead? Well, that means the areas are no longer the same. It means I can actually get away with 7% less area in LRFD. And say, how is that possible? How can I do this? What's changing? And this is the point when I cry. What's changing? How can it be that I can get away with, this is saying that I'm actually getting away with a lower amount of area, 7% less area with an LRFD design versus an ASD design when my live is equal to my dead. And this is actually saying I'm getting away with a 13% less area when my live is equal to one third of my dead. And this is saying when, when my live is equal to six times my dead, I actually need more area. What's changing? Are the loads changing? Is the load changing? No. Well, the live load is changing. The total load's not changing. Total load is the same for both an LRFT design and an ASD design. Yes? The load isn't changing. Is the equations that we're using changing? FY times AG. Is physics different in LRFD versus ASD? No. So what's changing? The safety factor is changing. The safety factor in an LRFD design varies based on the ratio of live to dead. The safety for an ASD, the safety factor for an ASD design is fixed. If you go back to an ASD design that we talked about earlier, it's fixed. It's dead plus live over 0.6 FY. It's fixed. The safety factor is only here. It's the only place where it is. It's fixed. The safety factor here, where is the safety factor at? Hit the button. Is that the only safety factor? And the fee factor, right? So you've got a safety factor here, and you've got a safety factor here. Just like I said on the previous page, the safety factor is a function of not only the average load factor, but also the fee factor. So what I'm trying to get at here is what LRFD, this is very important, because throughout your career, you will hear other engineers say that they don't like LRFD or they don't like ASD, and you need to say to them, they're the same, dude or dudette. There is no difference. The only difference is how you apply the safety factor. Okay? And they'll say, no, 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 no. You're going to end up with different areas. And you're like, yeah, you're right. You are, because it's how you apply the safety factor. In an LRFD-based design, if the live load is equal to three times the dead load, they'll be the same. But if they're not, the safety factor floats or changes for LRFD. It moves. But for ASD, it's always the same. Now, does that make sense?
Now I can tell you right now, I'm going to need a whole lot of more class participation for the rest of this class. It's going to be very painful. So I'm going to ask the question again. I mean, you got to impress cyberspace, you know? you got to realize you're going down on tape right now, okay? you got to set the stage. I think those people from Oklahoma, they don't know anything, right? Their first steel teacher was an idiot, right? That's what they're going to think, all right? Does this make sense? So you say yes. Cyberspace can't see you. You say yes. Why does it make sense? You felt confident enough to say yes, because obviously I wanted you to say yes. So at least you're good at reading me and what I want you to say. So now let's tell me why. Hey, man, we'll just sit here all hour if we have to. If you're not going to try, I'll just sit here. I've taught this class multiple times. And you don't have to be right, but you have to try. We have more than one location where the safety factor is being applied. Like we do. We have the fee factor and the 1.2. And 1.6, that's right. But I ask you, does it make sense to actually fundamentally have a safety factor that floats? with LRFD as opposed to one that's hardlined with ASD. Does that make sense? You say yes, hit the button and tell me why. Uh, it makes sense because with the variability of live load, uh, it causes more problems than a consistent dead load. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. That's exactly what I'm looking for. When you talk about how variable these things are that we have to deal with, the dead load we have a pretty good understanding of, right? It's fixed. Those chairs are dead load, right? Right? Your keyboard is dead load, okay, in cyberspace, all right? It's not moving. Well, maybe it is. It moves a little bit. But, but uh, um, you know, something else. Your chair is dead load, right? It doesn't move very much. Okay, but live load is something that can move all the way around. It can go all over. We never know whether we're going to have a party in a room, whether the room's going to be empty, right? We don't know. We don't know. So, um, live load varies. Okay? Live load varies a lot. And so it makes sense that when your live load starts to get way high, that you have more of a safety factor. And when your live load starts to get lower, you can get away with less of a safety factor. Why? Because there's less unknown. This is a prime question for an exam. Okay? So if you don't get it, you need to ask. Okay? Does it make sense? You need to ask. All right? Okay. Okay, so I've thrown in some important pages here from uh where's my view? I don't know how to zoom. Thrown in some important pages here from um that you may want to tab or or check in your steel manual. These are all for the thirteenth edition. These are all for the 14th edition, okay? I will be teaching this class and acting like this class is the 14th. I'm teaching out of the 14th edition. If you happen to have the 13th edition, then, um, you know, you're going to have to figure out the differences, all right? Now, I may not catch everything in my notes because there are some changes between the 13th and 14th edition, okay? So there may need to be some changes, and if you find some changes I need to make, please let me know, all right? Please let me know. These are some pages that you might want to use, you might find useful, and these were undergrad, okay? Grad, you're going to have to add all new pages, all right? All new pages, but these are all useful things. Now, we're going to talk about a topic that I, is near and dear to my heart, is very, very important, and one that you should not graduate with a master's degree and not master or understand. You have to understand this, okay? You have to get this. This is a topic that is not often taught at the undergraduate level. I teach it at the undergraduate level, but it's not common. So, so um, if you haven't had me, and this is something that's new, then that's okay. Okay? That's okay. If you have had me, and this is something new, then that's really bad. Okay? But, but uh, that's okay. Maybe you can learn this time around. Okay? 
we're going to talk about this concept called structural resiliency. And what we're going to find is that it's this concept that if you can lock it down now and understand it now, it will make everything else in this class so much easier to understand. Okay? So much easier to understand. So this is, it's time to hone in now because you will see examples of it over and over again and you will see test questions about it over and over again, okay? Great, so structural resiliency. It's common in nature for systems to find ingenious ways to survive. We can find examples with humans in you know nature, with animals and other things. I guess we're all animals too and reality television shows, right? That's the coolest thing about reality television shows. Is who's the most resilient? That's pretty, pretty much what it comes down to, right? Who is the most resilient? Yeah? That's why we, so, we love it so much. Who's going to break and who's not, right? That's what it's all about. So, for example, if a group of humans are trapped in a cave or, in an, or on an island, they will often work together as a group to adapt to their surroundings. And this is often referred to as resiliency. Structures behave in this exact same way. This exact same way. A structure will adjust and find ways to get help locally or globally to survive the outside loads placed on it. In each of these situations, the structure may be overloaded locally, but will find a way to survive by shedding the load to other parts of the structure. The sharing of load will continue until either each part of the structure is at yielding or a loss of stiffness or an individual element is at fracture and breaks. So let's talk about what does this mean? Let's, let's, let's give an analogy. Let's give an analogy. So what I like to use is I say if there's, if there's a family and there is a crisis in the family, okay? A crisis in the family. So let's just say that uh, one of the parents lose their job, okay? So the other folks in the family are going to jump in there and try to help out. They may go out and get jobs on their own. They may start to do more chores to free up some of those people that need to get jobs out on their own, right? They're going to all keep working, you know. They're going to start sacrificing and saving. They're going to adjust as a group so that the group survives. Okay? Okay? Does that make sense? And that group is going to keep going, keep pushing and trying to do the best they can to stay together until either every single member of the family is at their limit. They just can't do anymore, right? Little brother, he's, he's washing the dishes and cooking the dinner. You know, sister is scrubbing the toilets and doing whatever, and doing homework, and walking the dog, and going to school, and, you know, whatever, right? Selling ice cream, you know, whatever they can, you know? Everything they can to everyone in the family is at their limits. They're just all going to crash eventually. Or until one person gets so overloaded that they just snap, right? They just snap and break. Right? And that's horrible when it happens with people, and it's horrible when it happens to structures when people are in it, right? But it's way cool when it happens in the lab, right? And no one's in it, right? Okay, so we'll be showing some videos and talking about some of this stuff coming up. This whole idea that when you load a structure, you're going to find areas... You're going to be able to load and load and load if it's redundant and if the failures we're talking about are ductile failures. It's got this ability to ask for help. It's got this ability to say, I, I can't take it anymore. Can you help me? Okay? And the structure is going to say yes because it wants to live. It wants to keep going. It's what it wants to do. And if this doesn't make sense to you, don't worry. We're going to see this over and over and over again in this class. Okay? But mastering this concept now is extremely helpful for later on. This resistance to failure is what I call, this is a term that I have phrased, structural resiliency. Right? And we will see this behavior 
over and over and over again in this class. So I have some examples on the, pre on, on the next page. Okay. These examples I show, I've shown in some other classes. Okay. And I say, well, what if I have, I mean, this is an interesting structure, one that you're probably not used to thinking about or looking at. If I have a structure that looks something like this, and I don't have any, I, I know, notice that, that one member is deep and the other member is shallow, right? And the links are different, right? And I don't, I don't give any of those numbers, and so that may be uncomfortable for some of you, okay? But get over it, okay? It's life. Right? You, don't have, you don't always have all the details. You still have to make decisions. You still have to draw conclusions from things. Okay. So as if I have this structure and I start increasing the load P, what's going to happen? What's that? Okay, well, so we're going to start increasing and maybe before it breaks, everything's going to deflect, right? Things are going to deflect. And which one's going to deflect more? Is the big beam going to deflect more or the small beam? The same. Trick question, right? Because they're hooked together, right? Okay. So the deflection is going to be the same. Which one's going to pick up more load? The big beam or the small beam? The big beam. Hit the button next time. The big beam. The big beam. Why? It's stiffer. it's stiffer. That's right. It's stiffer. Because in the elastic range, load is distributed by stiffness. In the elastic range, load is distributed by stiffness. Okay? Now, just because it's stiffer and takes more load, does that mean it's going to fail first or reach its limit state first? Not necessarily. We need more details for that, right? We need to know what the depth is, the capacity. We need to know a lot more information, right? Right? But, Jacob, we, you said earlier you thought the small beam was going to fail. I mean, look how wimpy it looks, right? It, it doesn't look very big, and if, if you still think it looks big to you, I could draw it again, and I could make it like a thin sliver of beam, right? Right? I could, right? And we would say, yeah, we think it's going to break there first, right? It's so thin there. It's going to break, right? Okay, great observation. That's good. Now, when that beam breaks, does the structure fail? It depends on how big the big one is. Depends how big the big one is. Let's say I draw the structure again, and I make this big, and I make my other, my other piece incy, bincy, bincy, ee that big. Got another one over here, just for fun. Yee. Which one's going to break first? Well, we need details, but come on, use common sense. Unless this is made out of some super steel, right? This one's going to break first. You with me? Is the structure failed? Would you walk on it? You wouldn't? You lost a fiber? You lost something the size of a hair off a beam that's two foot deep and you're scared of it? Wimp? It's not what? It's not pin. Oh, pin. 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 It breaks. Are you scared of it? I just called you a wimp, so I'm not scared of it. I'd jump up and down on it. No, it's not going to fail. Think about it. You could take scissors and you could cut this. And would it fail? No. No. Not at all. There's still a load path. Yeah? There's still a way for loads to get from here to here. Yeah? It doesn't even matter if this is there or not. Now, did the capacity change? Would you have expected the ultimate capacity to change? Think about it. Yeah! Think about removing a member from a family. Does the family's ability to, 
t you know, resolve, does it reduce? Yeah, usually. Yeah, when you lose a member, yeah. When you lose a member here, yeah. Usually, now if it's a little bitty whatever, then it, you know, it, maybe it didn't help you. You know, maybe it didn't really change it much, right? But if you lost this member, yeah, I think you could make the argument, yeah, you lost some, some, some capacity, right? But is it still safe? It depends, you have to look at the loads. But yeah, just because you reach an event, just because we have a stiffness change, or something is modified by our structure, doesn't mean it's failed. That makes you feel a little weird. Get ready, because that's not the only thing that's going to make you feel weird in this class, all right? So let's say another example, an example that everyone in this class should have already seen or talked about. If I have a structure that looks like this, and I start to pull on one side and pull on the other with P, okay? And, <clears throat> and I start to look, if this connection starts to yield around the hole, is that bad? Some people are saying no. Some people looking like I'm crazy. And they're both right. I'm crazy and the answer is no. All right? It doesn't matter. And I'll explain to you why. When, when we calculate yield failure, where does it happen at? Does it happen at the holes? Do we care if bolts yield around holes? You better say no because every single structure you have ever been in is yielded around the holes. Every one of them has localized yielding. That's happened. But yielding, if it happens out here, is that bad? Yes. Yes. That is bad. Why is that bad? If this cross-section yields, every fiber on the cross-section yields, all along its, its area, if that yields, why is that bad? Does it mean it's going to break? Depends. Is it bad? Yes. Why? Exactly right. And why do we care about that? Fancy word man in elastic. Because it will never go back to how it should be. It has initial set, right? Or it has permanent set, pardon me. Has permanent set. That's true. What else is a problem? What happens when things go inelastic? Stiffness. Yes. And why do we care about stiffness? Because it will deflect forever under the constant load, right? If this is our stress strain diagram and our entire cross section is yielded, woo! -hoo! So, why is that a problem? That means for a constant load, it just keeps going, it just keeps moving until you hit strain hardening, right? Until you hit strain hardening. Yeah? Does anyone know about where that point is compared to yield? You know, if this is FY, does anyone know where? Strain, this top top of fracture is compared to where yielding occurs. Does anyone know? You understand what I'm saying? I'm saying the stress here compared to the stress here. Does anyone know about the ratio? It's about 15%. Okay? It's about 15%. This is about 1.15 times FY. Now, it depends on the steel. All right? But for grade 50, okay, it's around 15% difference. Okay? About 15% difference. So you may be able to get a 15% a more load out of something before it fractures, okay? But the stiffness is insane. David brought up permanent set being an issue. You've changed your structure. Now, if I have multiple ways this load can go, multiple members, multiple members, then yielding is not that big of a deal in one of them because there's still other directions the, the load can go. You with me? 
But if there's only one way in and out, and that gets blocked, we're in trouble. You with me? Okay, so let's talk about the question I started to ask earlier. Why is yielding around the hole not that big of a deal? Well, when we go and pull on this, and there'll be some stress out here, but it'll be nowhere near yielding, all right? I'm saying that up front, it's nowhere near yielding, okay? When I start to look at the stresses around the hole, they're gonna look like this. What? Why are they not uniform? Because the load's not high enough. That's true. But we would say out here the load would be P over A, right? The stress would be P over A, right? Uniform, right? Away from the hole it would be uniform, right? But at the hole we're saying it's not uniform. Right? Why? Because the area changes. And what's that called? Stress concentration. Right? Stress concentrations. Okay. There's something called St. Venant's Principle. Okay? St. Venant's Principle says the load is uniform away from changes in geometry and changes in load. Okay? But areas where we have changes in geometry or load, just like Isabella said, we have stress concentrations. What, what does that mean? Well, if you've never seen this before, you better open up your Strength and Materials book. You, you, should, you, should, you should read about it. Okay? What that means is that around reentrant corners, around holes, we have higher stresses than we do away from them. When we think of stresses, it's almost thinking of a water flow. Okay? Think of water flow coming from here, from one side to the other. The water is going to flow around and then actually bear on this bolt, right? That's the flow of forces. What's going to have to flow like this and like this? This is something like a free body diagram, something under like understanding force flow. And guess what? I know that you've been able to get through all of your classes without drawing these but you will not get through this class without drawing them, right? So you better start drawing them now. Better start thinking about them now, because when I start asking really hard questions on homeworks, okay, you start cursing me at night, all right? These are the key to getting the right answer. All right? All right. So if we think about this water flow, and the water flow being uniform out here, we think about when the water flow starts to get to the hole, well, wouldn't we expect the water flow right next to the hole to be a little higher than the water flow over here at the wall? You with me? Yeah? Yeah? Well, then the stress does the same thing. It's just like water. How's it going to flow? Where's it going to go? What's it going to want to do? Think like water. Okay? We can become water. Right? I'll finish this example, and that, that'll be it for, for today. So because of that, we have a higher stress at the hole. Okay? Higher stress at the hole. So if I had to make points one, two, three, where one is at the hole, two is in the middle, and three is at the edge. You with me? And I had to draw it over here in the diagram. I'm saying one is here, two is here, three is here. You with me? You with me? Structure's not a failure, is it? It's yielded, but it didn't die, did it? Are you scared of it? You better not be. We use this stuff all the time, okay? So we increase the load. We load, we increase it. P2 is higher than, than, than uh, P1, okay? I'm going to write P3 is greater than P2 is greater than P1, okay? So now I'm showing 1 is still yielded. 2 is right at its yield. 3 is not at yield. So we have 2 here. We have 1. How do I know where 1 is? I don't. It's on the plateau, right? It's flat. I don't know. Unless I have a finite element program, I'll never find it. Three is somewhere down here. Now let's say I do it again. I've increased the load again. Now I have all three at yield. All three. Three, two, one. What's that mean? Is it time to get scared? Yes. Why? Because all points on your cross-section are at their limit. Everyone in the family has done everything they could to help out. There's nothing more they can do. You with me? Okay, thanks.